Hi guys, Sensei Matt here. Uh, sorry it's been a while. I recorded a video the other day and the sound uh, wasn't connected so uh, the whole workout was wasted. So um, I'm going to do the same one again. Hopefully it will be better than the original one I recorded. So today what we're going to be doing, we're going to be doing a couple of basic combinations. We're going to be co covering slips, that's ways of moving out the way. And we're going to be uh, comparing that for you more advanced students to uh, Karate's Tai Sabaki and uh, we're also going to be uh, having a little warm up so before we do anything let's just have a little warm up now so we'll start with just um, some nice cardio exercise so cardio means that it works your heart gets your heart rate up helps to make you fitter uh, no point being fantastic at fighting but then you have a heart attack as soon as you get into a, into a self-defense situation because you're not fit enough. So we'll start off with our feet by our sides and our hands by our sides and we're going to jump our feet out and clap at the top and then we're going to go back to here. So feet out, clap. So this is a basic star jump. So let's just do 50 of these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. Okay, I'm just going to move this microphone out of the way because it's distracting. Okay, now we're going to do some leg raises. So, leg raises, I mentioned before when we did squat thrusts that our core is very, very important because our core powers everything. Uh, so let's just lay down now. Okay, put our hands by our sides and we're just gonna lift our feet an inch off the floor for 30 seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, keep those feet off the floor, 23, 24, no resting on your calves, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, now lift halfway and down, halfway and down, halfway and down, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Okay, now we're going to do circles here. Kind of figure eights, I guess. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Good. Okay. Now we're just going to do some uh, mountain climbers. So they're a bit similar to press ups in that they're going to work your core and your shoulders. We're going to put our weight forwards on our shoulders so we're supporting our weight then we're going to go up on our feet and we're just going to run like this 30 times 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 26, 27, 29, 30 good okay so that's just a little bit of uh, exercise. Now we're just gonna stretch. So the exercise gets our lungs and our heart strong. Now the stretching is gonna make sure that our joints are loose so that we don't injure ourselves. So we can start from the top and work down or from the bottom and work up. It's just easier to remember. 
if you're doing a warm up on your own that you work through the body rather than randomly jumping from place to place so the other day we worked from the feet upwards so, so, so today we're going to work from the head downwards so head back and forwards remember we don't go in circles we don't want to injure our necks Now look side to side. Now we're going to work our shoulders. So we're going to pull our elbow like that to the middle of our head. Then we're going to push backwards with our head to open our shoulder joint up here. Pull it down as well. Good. Now the other arm. Push back with your head. Pull your elbow across. I'm going to change that camera position when we uh, move off the exercises. Good. Okay. Now, put our arm across. Put our other arm up behind the middle of our tricep. Or above the elbow and pull that towards you and turn your, other, your upper body that way. It's just going to really increase the stretch of that shoulder muscle. Go change arms. If you've got injuries or you're a bit stiff, go gently, you don't have to get maximum stretch straight away. Okay, you don't have to keep up with any body stretch. You just have to try and increase your own flexibility over time. You're not going to do it Yoga people are quite happy to in increase their flexibility over a course of months or years. We probably want to do it a bit quicker than that, but you don't have to massively increase the stretch in one class. So uh, now this one's for Chris Evans. So uh, we're going to go arms forwards. So not too fast to start with. Make sure you're not next to a wall or anything breakable. I've got a lamp up there. And uh, when I was practicing once with my nunchucks, I smashed my very expensive lampshade, so don't be an idiot like me. Okay, backwards. I think my head's missing in the camera, but if it is, just imagine I'm a ghost. Okay, now for Chris, one forwards, one backwards. And change. Good, so if you're in a swimming pool, you'd be going in a circle now. Good, now let's... Uh, Work our hips in a circle, big circle. This one's great for practicing if you're gonna to go to Hawaii for your holidays. Probably not going anywhere for a while with this uh, lockdown. But uh, really get that going. Swing those grass skirts. There you go. Ooh, good, excellent. Now we'll push out and back. Stick your bums out, push back, out, and back. Good. So now we're going to loosen up our calves. Before we did these exercises, today what we're going to do, we're going to grab our foot here, and then we're going to push our hips out. Oops, help with the balance. You can grab a wall if you like to keep your balance, because this is a, about increasing there. If you want to help your balance, bend your leg. Good. Pushing that out. I can feel that really tight across there. Change legs here. Pulling it up towards your bum. And push your hip forwards to increase the stretch. There you go. Right, I'm going to leave that there. I'm just going to stop filming just to make sure the sound recorded this time. I'll be back with the main training. Hello guys, I'm back now. You can see my upper body. My head's not chopped off. Um, if my painting's distracting, let me um, let me know and I'll uh, move it for in future. Um, so I want to think about our guard today uh, to start with. So your guard is the way you hold your hands when you're not using them for something. But what do you think your guard is for? What's the purpose of your guard? Just give that some thought. I'll just give you a second to think about that. You can pause the video to think about it if you like. 
Okay, so your guard. Your guard. Your guard. Your guard. Your guard. Okay. Your guard serves essentially two purposes. The first purpose is to make it easy to protect yourself. So if somebody does a punch, you can knock out the way. If it's boxing, you can knock out the way like that. If it's uh, kickboxing or um, or self defense, your guards may be a little bit further out and you can knock stuff out the way. You can block kicks, you can protect yourself. Your hands are in a ready position to protect your head. The second thing that a guard does is keeps your hands in a ready position to attack afterwards. So I block and I hit back or I move out the way and I, I parry, maybe I'm slipping and I, I parry, my hands are all ready to go, okay? But there's a third, person, a third purpose that um, even you advanced people may not have considered and your guard helps to steer your opponent's attacks. So for example, if I stand like this and this is my guard, what am I saying to the other person? I'm saying I'm open here, attack me. Now that's fine if I've got something ready, if I've got something ready, okay? If I've got nothing ready, it would be really stupid to stand like that. Now, there are different types of guards. There's open hand, closed hand, tight boxing guard, further away. And different guards according to what art you're doing and what situation you're in. For example, boxing. Put my boxing gloves on. When we're boxing, We'll often keep a tight guard here with the gloves pinned to our chin so we're ready to move, okay, we're moving and if they do hit our guard, we've got flipping great big sofas here it's going to hit our chin, it's not going to hurt as much as if their knuckles or if their fists are smashed into our chin so we can afford to keep our hands pinned to our chin and also because we know that they're only going to be throwing punches no kicks, no knees, no elbows we know that we only need to keep our guard close when we're in punching range. So as soon as we step outside punching range, maybe we can drop our guard to showboat or whatever. I don't believe in that, but, but um, some people like to fight that way to uh, play a mental game with their opponent and make their opponent feel um, angry because they're keeping their guard low and showing disrespect. In self-defense, I would keep my guard further out. I, I don't tend to keep my hands closed in the fist. Um, I tend to think of that more for beginners because then when you punch your hands already in a fist shape. But then I would say beginners shouldn't be punching anyway. Uh, beginners should probably be using palm heels because a beginner if you punch you're probably going to break your knuckles or your wrists. Whereas if you palm heel, look, you don't have to worry about breaking your wrists and you're, you're hitting with the soft part of your hand. So I would say keep your hands out. So look, the, fur the further out the other person is, the further out your guard goes. So if somebody's outside there, out there, outside kicking range. So the range is the distance from me to them, okay? So just looking at my wall, hopefully you can see my wall up. I'm just in kicking range, yeah, I can just about kick that wall. So if I'm back a little bit, I don't need to keep my hands up here because there's no chance they're gonna surprise me with a punch. I keep my hands out here where I'm a bit more nimble, okay? now. We can also have what's known as a center line guard or uh, just a, a regular guard, which is a bit wider, okay? So, generally, in my experience, I've seen that the Chinese martial arts, Kung Fu, Wing Chun, that sort of thing, use a center line guard because they use a thing called chain punching. They punch with a vertical fist and they'll go to here and their guard will be down the center. Now, th th that may not be true across the board, but that's been my experience. Whereas for Self-defense people, and for MMA fighters, that sort of thing, we, we tend to keep our guards a little bit open. Okay, now first of all, let me explain why a centerline guard is useful. A centerline guard is useful because it covers my face, my elbows are in, and so my ribs are easily protected, and it, what it does is it tends to force the opponent to step off the line to attack me, because they can't punch through the middle because my guard is here in the way. But, um, there are disadvantages to that, I'm not going to go into that at the moment. A more versatile guard is here, slightly open, inviting an attack a little bit down the middle, but it's very, very strong and easy to block here. Not so easy to block here with a, with, um, a center line guard. So we're going to work on that guard. If you're, um, if you're a beginner, you might want to keep your fist shut like this. So here's how we make a guard. 
we hold our hands up like this see they're just kind of my, my elbows just sticking out from my body a little bit with my knuckles roughly shoulder height and then I just step back and one hand goes back so you'll see whatever legs in front so in this case it's my left leg if you are right handed you should keep your left leg in front okay if you're left handed you generally will go the other leg forwards that will probably be more comfortable to you this is called a southpaw um, stance and this is a regular stance okay so most people are right handed so we'll go regular so right, right leg back left leg forwards if my left leg is forwards my left hand should be in the front and the other hand is back see that my left hand is in front and my left leg is in front so here so what that does is it gives my light parrying hand here and then my power hand which is going to be backed up by my hips if I'm doing a straight punch or I'm doing a hook or I'm doing an over punch is backed up by my hips as well so that's going to be my strong wrist my strong hand my most comfortable way to deliver my most powerful punch so we've got my elbows in so that if they want to try and get round and get me in the ribs I can easily crunch up and cover my ribs my hands are wide so they're easy to go side to side to parry or to parry forwards if you're doing boxing now I'll change here to a southpaw just so it's easy for you to see. So let's imagine now we're in a self defense situation, my guard's out, I'm ready, I'm looking at the person's chest. Now they move closer, as they move closer, my guard moves closer. My guard moves closer. Now, if they're very, very close in punching distance, if I'm scared of them, I might even bring my hands up to the side of my temples like that. So then their punches are gonna hit my forearms instead of smashing into my face. And I'm gonna be moving, this is where you need to be fit, to make it a bit harder for them to hit you because now they don't have an easy path there they're going to have to hook around to the side of my head and now I can easily just block there just carefully don't get caught out by a combination okay so let's put our hands up here and just move move so bob and sway maybe fade backwards a bit hands on here this is self defense we're talking about here good okay now back to a regular guard okay so now we're going to move on, we're going to do, um, just uh, we did straight punches the other day, I'll just recap those quickly. So we've got our pads, we put our hands into our pads like this. If you don't have pads, hopefully you're working with somebody now, if you don't have pads, they can just hold, hold their hands up like this. And uh, you can put your mitts on so that you don't smash your hands up. And you're going to hold your pads inwards, just a little bit wider than your head, facing in 45 degrees. Do you see that? Not flat, turn in. And then what you're gonna do, you're gonna hit your right hand to the right pad and your left hand to the left. So I'm gonna start with my left hand. So I'm gonna go across, one, two. So this is encouraging me to use my hips. One, more power, more power. I'm pivoting on the balls of my feet. So let's just do 10 like that. One, two, three. Pivot on the balls of your feet. Even exaggerate it so you turn the hips in. Four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, remember when we punch, especially when we do our crosses, we don't want our elbows to come out. Okay, so that was a drill to work on our hips and our punching, hitting with the front two knuckles, remember. If you're a beginner, you might want to hit with your palm heels instead, okay? But now we're going to... Do the same combination, this is our combination number one, but as if we're hitting a real person. So before we do that, we're going to imagine the person's in front of us. We call that visualising. So we visualise, we, we, uh, we envision that there's somebody there standing in front of us who's going to attack us. So I'm pretending there's somebody there, he's the same height at me as me, sorry. What am I trying to accomplish with this combination? Well look, if I do one, two to the same place his guard is already up so he blocks one blocks two and i've not achieved anything all i've done is worn myself out so i need to use my combination to move his guard around so i'm going to punch my number one just past his fist and then uh, try and get him to commit with a block so there's my number one and he blocks Number two, I go low and hit him in the ribs. I could just change um, sides. I could do number one here and number two over here somewhere and try and get through that way. Or I could try and overwhelm him with power or speed. But for now, we're going to be a bit more tactical. So this time we're going to go head, ribs. 
so we're going to drop now when we go down for the ribs guys i don't want to see you lean forwards i can't see you at all but i'm sure you'd be honest and tell me if you did so i don't want you to go one two because there's, there's two reasons for that one if you get in the habit of throwing your shoulders forwards especially as you get older or if you're not warm you can throw your back out you can strain your back just by throwing it forwards in a hurry especially if it's cold as well so what we want to do here is drop our height level uh, level change they call that in mma or in uh boxing i don't know what they call it i guess that's a level change as well so we bend our legs this is why we need strong quadriceps in our thighs here i think that's the quads right okay so we're going to go one two head ribs remember to bring our hands back to our face every time so let's do 10 like that now and i just want you to bend your legs for number two okay so one level change punch to the ribs two i'm imagining somebody in front of me the same size as me one two one two one two now we get faster one two one two one two keep our back straight one two don't want my head getting closer one two one two if you're a little bit older your knees might be aching now um, mine certainly are okay one two one two one two in a real fight you wouldn't be doing 10 or 15 of those you'd probably only do one or two and then the fight would be over or you'd be out cold okay so that's our combination number one we pull the guard hit them low now what if they're a bit more experienced we might need to put together a slightly more sophisticated, a bit cleverer combination. So now we're going to go to our combination number two. But before we do that, I just want to explain the difference between types of combination. So a combination is any time you do one technique followed by another technique or two techniques at the same time. Probably wouldn't do three or you'd look a bit spazzy, but two, com two techniques, two techniques, one, two, three, four, still a combination, okay? Generally, we don't tend to train long combinations because you can't be sure what the other person's gonna do after one or two hits. Okay, so we basically have two main types of combinations and then one, one other type of combination which might be a class of its own. We've got offensive, that means attacking combinations, and defensive, that means defending combinations. And then I guess the last type would be counter-attacking combinations, which are not quite the same as defensive. So let me give you an example, guys. So an offensive or attacking combination is when I initiate the attack, I start the attack, okay? So I imagine the other person standing there. I'm not gonna wait for them to start to hit me. Once I know they wanna hit me or hurt me, I attack first, okay? So. I throw a combination, bang, 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 bang. I do something rather than waiting for them. Now, there's a, there is a saying which says, action is faster than reaction. So action is when you do something. Reaction is when you see something happen, then you do an action in response to that. So for example, a common karate combination might be, I draw the other person onto me, let them launch an attack, slip and counter attack. It's also quite common in boxing. If you're, um, if you're a shorter guy, uh, the long guy might be using his reach over you. So you wait till he does his punch, slip off the line and then over punch, okay? Um, actually, we need to talk about slips. No, we'll, we'll, do, we'll carry on with these in this for a while. So, basically, whenever you do anything, there is a cost in time, that means it, it takes time to see what you want to do, decide what you're going to do, and then do it. Now I heard a long time ago, it's about a sixth of a second from, um, from uh, see something to do, think to do it, and then do it. Each of those is a sixth of a second. So, if I decide I'm going to attack you, I make all of that decision while we're just standing there or moving about. And then I throw out an attack and you've got one sixth of a second to see what's coming in, decide what you're gonna do about it and do it. Whereas I only had one sixth of a second for my technique to reach you. So my action, by going first, 
by attacking you rather than waiting for you to attack me, my action cut down your chance of defending me. That's why people who are very, very aggressive fighters, especially people who don't mind getting hurt, you know, like, ah, those kind of fighters, will often win a fight, not because they're skillful, but because they're just aggressive and it overwhelms people. And then when you get that really aggressive person attacking you, it's really scary. And, um, you know, unless you face that, it's very hard to cope with, even if you're quite trained, you know? So, I prefer offensive or attacking combinations. And you can tell attacking combinations because they're usually combinations that go forwards. I'm moving into the other person's space. Hello. Okay, so defensive combinations are combinations where somebody has done something to me and I'm oh, defending. A common one, as I just showed you there, was a front kick. So if I was doing an attacking front kick, I generally would start with my back leg Bang! Kick, land forwards and punch. If I'm doing a defending front kick, well first of all look at my attacking front kick, look where my body is. As I kick my body moves closer, my body moves closer and I carry on going forwards. When I'm defending, my body moves backwards, I use my front leg to defend. So this is a defensive front kick. Okay, so if somebody's coming at me with a knife, move my body back, kick them in the ribs. Okay, move my body back, try and hit the knife. Move my body back, just cover up, okay? So, defensive and then counter-attacking is more like a defensive combination, but just something I'm a bit ready for. So, um, I've got a counter-attack ready, so perhaps I might slip and reverse punch. That might be one, okay? So here's a karate slip, here's a boxing slip. We'll talk about slips a bit more in a second. Okay, so, we're just gonna do um, a couple more of our combinations, so we're gonna go head, Stomach, head, stomach. So that's an attacking combination. We are taking the fight to them. Now, let's just talk about slips a sec. Right, slipping is moving out the way, basically. In karate, we have, let me just check the sound a sec. Yep, that's good. Don't want the battery to run out because I've done this once already. Okay, so in karate, we have a thing called body movement or tai sabaki, tai sabaki. And body movement is moving out of the way, moving off the line. Same thing in Aikido um, and in Jiu-Jitsu. In uh, boxing, and to a lesser extent kickboxing to my experience, you slip instead. So a slip is getting your head out of the way of a target, basically. Strangely enough, I don't know, never seen slips with a body for um, boxing, but then that's because they tend not to be hitting the body quite as much. Um, so, not with straight punches anyway. So. Um, for a boxing slip, let's just bring our guards up really close to our head and we're going to turn off and move our head. So if you can see a window or get somebody to just do a slow palm heel to your head, when, that, when it comes in, you're going to turn off and move your head off the line. Now what we don't want to do, we don't want to go, take a big step over here, see my back's all bent and my, I've leaned out too far because I'm too far to get back into the fight. Not only that, but my weight is loaded up. I've got too much weight on this leg. Okay, so now I'm kind of putting a strain on my knee and, it, and I can't move so quickly. So for boxing slips, I really want to keep my feet mostly planted. So here I'm going to plant my feet, but I'm going to turn my hips. And this might seem odd to you or counterintuitive for you adults, but we're actually going to turn away from the attacker. So the attacker's here. Whenever somebody attacks, my gold standard is that I want to be on the outside of their fist because then it means their other fist is not hitting me. So here, I'm going to slip this way. Now it seems a bit weird to leave your back open, and in self-defense especially, because you could get kicked, or in a competitive karate or kickboxing, you could get kicked with that other leg, okay? They, they, they could hit you there and then round kick with the front leg to your back. So we don't want to over slip and turn our back. We just want to slip a little bit and load up. And now we're in a position here to do an uppercut, or to slip and do a straight as we move, or to slip and do a hook as we move, or a hook over the top. So we've loaded up, that means, when, when we load, that's a term that means, or a, a phrase that means, we're getting ourselves ready to add more power to something. So look, if I'm here, and I do a hook from here, there's no body behind it, okay? Now, I don't wanna do this in a fight, because it's too easy to see coming. But if I'm slipping, 
see how that's loaded it so it's like turning off but I'm turning off hidden by their attack so it just looks like I'm moving out the way and now I've loaded up my hips ready to do something okay so um, we're just going to do some slips we're going to keep our feet still and we're going to do boxing slips so we're going to go one and then let's just do a hook back to the head two hook back so we've loaded three if your attack is a lot bigger than you you won't be able to get over their shoulder so let's do some to the body as well four five okay now when I'm going to the body I generally prefer to punch with a vertical punch in um, karate I believe that's called tate um, which is uh, a horizontal uh, vertical punch there because it presents the knuckles and you rip across the the uh, ribs and the stomach muscle so if I'm going to the head I'm going to go here or here depending on the angle might even go inverted completely upside down but to the body I'm generally going to go this way so I'm going to go one hook here okay so let's uh, just hit with those front two knuckles load go slip go so we want to keep our slips nice and small just move our head out the way enough so that the hand comes past us okay um and um for the really experienced people the later you leave your slip the more committed the uh, opponent will be committed means that they put everything into it so imagine if i'm attacking you now and i just uh, just throw my hand out oh i'm not committed i can easily adjust to whatever you've just done but if I'm, ah, I have to do a really big attack to try and get through, then that leaves me open to your counter attack. Okay, so here, so small slip, load, hook to the body with horizontal knuckles. Load, hook to the body, load, hook. So as we go, we're slightly drawing our fist away from our body, our chin, there. Keep the other hand up common counter attack to a slip would be to turn with the other hand and hit you in the jaw it's a perfect knockout angle from the other hand okay so load hit okay now hooks back to the head load hook load hook slip hook load hook slip hook okay now I want you to compare that to the karate version so with the karate version called Tai Sabaki body movement and with that we commonly try and get our whole body out of the way so we'd often take a step like that and we'd end up facing towards the opponent and the reason is very different with uh, boxing I only have my punches with karate or self-defense I might be parrying a punch grab that break the elbow knee in the body whatever you know so I often want to be in a position not just to punch them back but to dominate their entire body. Um, for MMA, for example, you might want to get to here and you might want to do some kind of throw. You might want to get to here and, I don't know, something crazy, a kataguruma or a shoulder throw. Or you might want to go to here and do uh, a koso to Gary, which is an outside, uh, an outside reaping throw. Or you might want to get to here, elbow in the ribs, grab the wrist and elbow. So, let's just do that. So, for this, we're going to take a shuffle step a shuffle is when you move one foot then the other foot so we're going to move look here i'll show it here we move our front foot then our back foot front foot then our back foot so here let's do it here guys so we're going to shuffle slightly off the line not much because we don't want to go too wide because if we go too wide we're out of fighting distance so we want to stay close um, my friend Dave Bradford used to say Aikido people said love your opponent so that means stay close to them the closer you are the less options they've got okay same in um, BJJ or submission wrestling you want to be close and claustrophobic because then they're not free to turn and, and counter attack so here let's do front step back step face the opponent and then back front step back step face the opponent let's do uh, eight more front back so we're moving our whole body out the way tie sabaki body movement front back front back keep our guard up and open we're not punching here we're seizing controlling front back maybe that was a little parry maybe that was a um a palm heel to the head maybe this was a choke on the wrist maybe this 
as an arm break. So I grab the wrist here and break the arm across my stomach or chest. In my case, my stomach's rather big, so that. Okay, so here, just covering. Maybe I don't want to hit them at all. Okay, here, maybe I use a knee. So move, knee in the stomach or in the ribs. Move, grab the wrist, sweep the leg, elbow to help them down. Okay, grab the wrist, elbow in the ribs. Move, move. So the person's there, remember they're coming forwards. Move, move, okay. So that's a contrast between Thai Sabaki and uh, slipping. Let me just check the uh, camera a second. Yep, that's good. Sorry, I don't want to waste time filming it twice. Okay, so now let's do uh, another offensive combination. So we did jab, cross, we went high and low. We pulled their guard up, hit them where they're open. Now we're gonna create another opening. So let's just say they're quite quick with their hands. So we wanna create an opening for a kick. So we've got two types of front kicks basically. <coughs> we've got snapping kicks, which are designed to do deep damage and thrusting kicks or teeps for, for you Josiah which are designed to thrust people away. So your targets um, vary according to what you're trying to do. If you were hitting with the ball of your foot here, the ball of your foot, and you can practice that, just put your foot against a wall like that. Let me, can I move this monitor out of the way? No, okay. Just put the ball of your foot against the wall. That's the part of your foot you should be hitting with most of the time. But there are times when you might hit with the heel, okay, or even with the instep. So a snapping kick. It's all about the hips, what the hips are doing. So I lift my leg up high and then snap. So a snapping kick generally would go to the ball of the foot to the stomach or the ball of the foot could even kick to the inside of the knee to take the balance out or I could do it underneath the jaw depending on how flexible you are. Um, I generally am not a fan of kicking above the waist in self-defense. And the reason is you never know what the conditions are going to be around you. Obviously if it's icy or snowy, well obviously you don't do high kicks, but what if it's very dry and dusty? You might not have noticed that. You might be in your work clothes or your school clothes, it's very dusty and you go to do a high kick and then you slip over because your feet slipped on the dust. What if it's early morning or late evening and it's dew, you're coming home from the skate park, you're walking across the field from work, somebody jumps out on you, the floor's dewy, you didn't think it was wet because it's been dry and sunny all day, and then suddenly you go to do something high, high, and it takes your balance out and you fall on the floor, now you're in big trouble, okay? So, I generally try to keep my kicks below solar plexus height. There are times when I might, front kick's actually quite, quite a safe, versatile kick, but I was once in a really uh, genuine fight, and I kicked somebody in the head, and then fell on the floor, and they all just stood and laughed at me, it was very annoying. Um, so, um, keep your kicks low. Okay, so. Snapping kick, Ooh, in the stomach. Snapping kick, okay, now there's a different type of snapping kick. Um, I think it may be called Kensetsugeri, and it's um, with the top of the foot. Can you imagine what target that would be? A bit more obvious now? So, most guys have got a quite a well-developed protection for their groin. If you do anything towards a groin, even little kids, they very quickly cover up, okay? But, if you do a combination, there's your kick to the groin. If they're attacking you with a knife, their focus is on the knife, bang, kick to the groin, okay? So, I think that's one of your best weapons, actually. So, kick to the groin, despite what people like uh, Baz Rutten and uh, others say, um, groin kick, very effective. I've never seen, ever seen somebody take a full kick to the groin and just carry on, except one guy on Fight Science who spent 30 years killing his testicles so that it wouldn't hurt. Okay, so, um, so, snap kick, we lift the knee, we keep the hips where they are, and then we just snap the foreleg out like that. It's a very fast kick designed for close distance. We're not trying to change the person's position, we're just trying to hurt them or cause a, a fold. A thrusting kick or a teep. So um, a thrusting kick is designed to penetrate 
or to push somebody away from us, okay? So for that, we lift up the same as you did with the snap kick, but this time, instead of going at an upwards angle, we go at an outwards angle, and we push our hips forwards to give it power. So here, and then push. And the foot you're standing on, regardless of how you start with that foot, it wants to be turned out to the corner at the end, so it gives you something hard to push off. You can't see my feet real well here, or at all, I don't think. So at the moment, my toe's facing forwards, I lift, and then as I thrust, I turn my toes out to the corner, pivot on the ball of my toes, never on my heel, because it's better for your balance. So I'll go up, thrust. Okay, let's see if we can do 10 snap kicks and 10 thrusting kicks. So you can kick with your favorite leg, that's probably your right, but you might prefer your left. If you're gonna use your left, make sure your left leg is back, okay? Because we wanna kick with our back leg, it's an attacking combination. So here, snap kick, one, Two, three, four, lift those knees up, five, lift the foot up next to the to, next to the other heel to start with, kick, and then back to there as I afterwards. I'm breaking it down for you, but really I should just go all the way back to the floor. I shouldn't stop at each point. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, now we're gonna do snap kicks to the groin. So we're gonna point our toes as we lift up into the privates. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now thrusting kick. So we're gonna lift the foot, then thrust the hips out as we get near to the end of the kick. One, two, Three, four, five. Before I go any further, quick quiz for you. What target do you think you'd be hitting with a thrusting kick? Where's the best place to hit somebody if you want to push them backwards? Give that some thought. Okay, so it depends on how well conditioned the other person is and what they're doing. If they're coming forwards and their stomach muscles are tense and they're in good shape, their stomach's nice and strong. Otherwise, you want to hit something relatively bony. So, your targets will be the solar plexus, the hip flexors will cause a bending and a twist as you kick, but it won't necessarily push them back. So if they've got a knife and you kick the back, that could still come forwards. On top of the privates here, where the pelvic girdle meets the bones of the pelvis in your skeleton, they meet here. There's nerves above that called the hypogastrius. And if you hit that, that's bony. So you're not hitting the privates, you're hitting above it. And that pushes them back, but again, they fold forward. So be careful, if they've got a knife, that might not be a good target. Okay, so I would say the stomach or the ribs or the chest would be good targets if you want to push somebody back. So here, let's just go for the stomach. One, two, three. Four, five, six, you might feel that aching in your other hip flexor. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Now let's put that into our combination number two. So combination number two, we're gonna hide our kick and we're gonna hide it by doing two punches. So this time, instead of going high, low, we're gonna go high, so that distracts them. It doesn't even need to hit them. High. Leave that fist out there, low. Right, one, two, three. One, two, kick with the back leg, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, and that's a good way, when you're trying to learn a combination, you could just count to get yourself in the habit. One, two, three, don't go bouncy like that. Or you could say, jab, cross, kick, jab, cross, kick. Build up a mantra or a little chant for yourself to help you remember. Okay, so, now the timing here. This is a great combination, by the way. I very, very rarely fail with this combination, even against experienced people. Um, because people are so committed to the punches, and then you can slide the kick in as you make up the ground. Um, more experienced people, you can shuffle as you do number one, close a lot of distance. So even if they're running away, you can tap them against the edge of the ring. So. Here's the timing. We don't go one, pull that back, two, pull that back, three. 
because they're not working together. It's three separate techniques. What we're gonna do is that one goes out. As that comes back halfway, that one passes. And as this one goes halfway, imagine we've got a piece of elastic attached to our knee and it pulls the knee up on the kick. So the kick is hidden underneath the hand. So they call that in the shadow of the hand. So the hand's here, the person's head's here, he's looking down, your arm is hiding your leg. Not completely, but in the, in the spur of the moment, it's hard for them to see. So we're gonna go one, pass in the middle, pull the leg out, two. So the foot and the hand, second hand, almost lands together. One, two, one, two, one, two. So uh, I like to think of it as a punch, per kick, punch, per kick, punch, per kick, punch, per kick, punch, per kick. Doing it with me guys, punch, per kick, punch, per kick, punch, per kick, head, per kick, head, head stomach, head, head ribs, head, head ribs. A bit faster now. One, two, three, four, five. What moves faster, feet or hands? Your hands move much faster than your feet, so you need to anticipate. You can't throw your hands and expect your feet to be the same speed. So you need to anticipate and start moving your leg faster. So one, here. So I'm actually starting to kick before this one's fully back. One, here, so that it gets there in time with my punch, okay? Right, okay, that's combination number two, punch, punch, kick. So it's changing the height, we're occupying their guard, and then we're kicking them in the ribs or the stomach or the groin. Okay, now we've got the opposite of that. So remember guys, a combination is basically designed to trick the other person so that you can hit them with something. So, there's lots of ways we can trick people in fighting. We can pretend to do one thing and then do another. Um, for example, I might do kick, kick, not a kick, punch in the head, Superman punch or something, yeah? Or I might do jab, jab, fake punch, okay? There are some ways that I could trick people, but a combination is designed to trick them by pulling their guard in different directions. So while they're blocking that thing, they're blocking that thing, you're coming in somewhere different. So this time, maybe we've done our number two combination a couple of times. Now they're already used to that low kick. So let's give them what they expect. So let's start with a low kick. So we go low, high, high. Now we could go low, high, low again, but I think it's probably more effective just to go high, high, because we're gonna go get their guard down, punch to their head, that's their other guard come across if they're really quick, and then punch to their head again. We could move off the line, we'll keep it simple for now. So lift the knee up, one, two. More experienced people land your first punch when your foot lands. One, there's a foot landing on the floor, that's where my punch lands. Two, first punch might not hit at all, one, Two, now, if I'm doing a kick first, what sort of kick do I want to do so the rest of the combination works? Do I want to do a snapping kick or a thrusting kick? Give that some thought. So I'm doing a kick followed by two punches. So would you say a kick is a long range technique or a close technique? A kick tends to be a longer range technique. Now. If I'm going to do a kick, I don't want to push them away and then have to chase them with my punches. I want them to come, come to me or stay where they are. So I could do a snapping kick that's quite close up. I'm not thrusting out. As they go to do without a move off the line, punch in the head here and then punch here or uppercut or hook there. Okay, but I want their head to be heard. I don't want them to go miles away and then I can't hit them with my punches. So, here we go. So we're gonna do snapping kick, punch, punch. Snapping kick, move off the line, punch, punch. Snapping kick, move off the line for the first punch and then uppercut with the second. Snapping kick, move, punch, uppercut. 
move, change the angle, hit them on the corner of the jaw. Uh, and this time, yep, we'll go uppercut again. Okay, this time we're gonna go straight punch, hook punch. So, let's go. Kick, move, straight punch, hook punch. Hook punch very powerful, but it's hard to get in because it takes a bit longer to get there, it's easy to see. Because look, big circle, straight jab. Okay, so, one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Let's go back to straight, straight. One, two, three. Remember to come back to your guard. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Why am I keeping my guard up here if I'm doing kicks? Because I'm in punching range. Even though I'm kicking, I'm doing close-up kicks and I'm closing into punching range. So I want to keep myself protected. Okay, last couple. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, let me see what else I've got to do now. Um, actually guys, look, I think I'm gonna leave that for today. I think that's a good half an hour. And um, we'll move on to some defensive techniques tomorrow or some fundamentals. Uh, not tomorrow, but whenever I get around to it. Okay, guys, so I um, hope you're all doing well. Stay safe. Practice. Practice your basics. Those people who train with me, make sure that you look at your grading syllabus. The video is on this channel. So when we come back, you can all be ready. Okay, guys. Have a great day. See you later.